today I wanted to talk about not about uh, let's see um, not about just K through 12 in schools, but about teaching and learning that applies to you as teachers and also as learners. And what I'd like to do is knock down the walls of school because increasingly that's what we're doing, right? Technology is erasing walls in ways that I dreamed of when I was in graduate school, but actually never ever thought would happen. But now it's happening. So the question I'm asking you is, can you teach a dolphin how to type? Mm, maybe, but why would you? And in the same way, why would you sit in classes and why would kids in K through 12 sit in classes where they're learning meaningless, isolated tasks where they ask themselves constantly, what has this got to do with me and my life? Now, as you get older, you have strategies to uh, space out, to think about something else, to do your homework in another class, and you figure out what you need to know and study that. But if you're a young child, you actually don't have those strategies yet. There's strategies that, unfortunately, we learn in school. But much of your learning is actually learned outside of school. So, uh-oh, maybe I am too old to figure out technology. Uh, education, what John Dewey says, is education is not preparation for life. And that's all that everyone's been talking about. Education is life. And the education a child, a three-year-old, goes through is actually his or her life. And the education you're going through as a college student is not preparing you for something. It's your life. And as you go through life, you will continue to learn. You will continue to be a teacher. And you will continue to be a student. So what Robert Hutchins, the founder of the University of Chicago, the object of education is to prepare the young to educate themselves throughout their lives. And that's what I want to advocate for. Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College is about preparing people in one segment of their life to be teachers. But that doesn't ignore all they've learned before and all they've taught before and all they're going to learn after and all they're going to teach after in and outside a classroom. And that's the responsibility I'm putting on you. If you're a learner, then you have to be a teacher. So all of us teach children. All of us teach ourselves. All of us teach our peers. Some of you are going on job interviews. You're going to have to teach the person interviewing you all about yourself. And a lot of that teaching and learning goes on in schools, formal education, ASU, out of school, informal education. And, it's a, and what Albert Einstein says, it's a miracle that curiosity survives formal education. So I want us to think about situations where we've learned a lot that actually isn't at ASU, wasn't in high school. I mean, in middle school, probably what you learned a lot about was who you are how to navigate a very difficult social life. And all of that is as important, I would maintain, as perhaps the algebra you learn to ultimately good, get a good score in the SAT. Because tests are a big part of this. We value ourselves. We value other people often based on some moment in time when they took a test. So if it's a miracle that curiosity survives formal education, then what is your responsibility as a learner to take out of formal education what you can, and also to be a teacher to help other people survive and navigate what Dewey says is life? So, Who's worthwhile to teach? Often in my line of business, I hear people describe in a way that marginalizes them. And I have to say, probably an adjective, even though unmeaning, to diminish someone. Adjectives to diminish people are used all the time with children. Uh, and with students, college students. So what is intelligence? I mean, I've worked in a university since 85, 
and I've met a lot of smart people. Some smarter than others, some smart in different ways. So who's worth teaching? In K-12 education, we sort that out all the time. We put kids in isolation, we identify them, we say they're at risk. There's always this heroic story of someone who's defined at risk, who broke through those bounds and actually survived it and was successful. But those names and those, those labels were not accurate to begin with. So I want to convince you that intelligence can be seen in a lot of different ways. So even that kind of a uh, dumb person who you are in a class with, maybe you're just not recognizing their real intelligence. Uh, so intelligence is dynamic. That means that it changes. <clears throat> it changes depending upon who you're with, where you're at, what age you are. It grows, it changes, it diminishes. It's not static. Intelligence is diverse. In my line of business, intelligence is measured by everything from the neck up, right? So I have a PhD. So that would be a sign of my intelligence. But actually, what Michael Crow would tell you and has told me is he measures my intelligence by my ability to take ideas and implement them. To take something that other people think of, to broker it, and then make it happen. Some people would call that common sense, which often is lacking in higher ed, I must say. But I would call it a certain kind of intelligence. So there's different ways to look at the value of people's brains. Intelligence is distinct. So we just heard a speaker who clearly is intelligent. I don't know what his IQ is. I, I guess he's a sophomore in college. But to me, his intelligence is displayed by his ability to take his life experiences and turn them into a way for us to learn about life, the sadness of life, the outcomes of life, and how you deal with it. So not just if he got an A in the last class he took. And that's what we were responding to a real intelligence that maybe, maybe we should give him a test and see where he fits and where he belongs and what his SAT was. Or maybe we should come to understand and observe and listen the different ways we can learn from people about our own intelligence and the respect the intelligence of others. Martin Luther King. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of a true education. And often, in K through 16, we don't talk about the moral fiber of people. So again, Jimmy is talking. Does anyone here doubt his moral fiber? Talking about his mother the way he did. The commitment, the loyalty, the love. But we somehow put that in a margin. We say that's not really what success is about. But you're going to have to figure out if that is really the success for you. But more importantly, for you as a teacher, that hopefully you will come to understand you will be the rest of your life. So what are the methods by which people learn? Um, I think it's really important to understand that learning isn't about rote, especially with young children. It's about being active. It's about engaging, using your mind. And experiential education actually provides the context and the framework. So uh, let's say I'm, I've taken a child, a fifth grader, to the zoo. The context and the framework is look at the yellow giraffe. How many lions are there if you're an intentional teacher? But actually, are those substantially important questions? Just because a child is young doesn't mean we should ask them stupid things. And just because I will say as a professor, there's a student in a college class, we should equally not ask them stupid things. And so we, as teachers, need to think about what are questions that are engaging. 
that help you extend the knowledge you have? What are the questions you have that need to be answered that help you construct more knowledge from the environment around you, which can include books and people? For younger children, it's things, things they can touch. So if you have children or you have younger siblings, throw out workbooks, throw out flashcards, they're meaningless in real engagement in learning. And if you're going to intervene as a teacher, shame on you, if that's the best you can do. So when you see a child who's dropping a spoon off a high chair, when that child does that and they drop a spoon, they actually don't know the physical world. They don't know if that spoon's going to go that way, going to go up or go down. They drop it, the adult picks it up, puts it back in the high chair, drop it, the adult starts you know, saying, this kid is trying to drive me crazy. The kid is trying to figure out gravity. And when the kid finally realizes the spoon will always go down, they'll never drop that spoon again. They've learned it. They've moved on to something else. So think about that in your own life. You test and test and test and figure it out. And some things you move on. And some things, you bring pieces of that with you. Teaching can be spontaneous. You find yourself in a situation that you didn't know was educational. And all of a sudden, you're teaching someone something or learning something from someone. And it, teaching has to be intentional. Learning is not. But teaching has to be intentional. I'm going to intervene, and I'm going to tell you I'm here. This is teaching. Doesn't mean you're all learning, sadly, I had, have had to find out in my life. But it does mean this was intentional. And it best happens when you can make mistakes. George Bernard Shaw, a life spent making mistakes is not any more honorable, but more useful than a life spent doing nothing. So has a child been given something to learn that's worth learning? What's the curriculum? I have a PhD in curriculum. Curriculum in Latin means journey. And I think it's a great way to think of the stuff you're learning. All the stuff you're learning. And all the stuff you think other people should learn. How's that moving you along on your journey? Where are you going? What do you need to know? Curriculum is the stuff that will help you get there. So what are you teaching children? What are you teaching your peers? What am I teaching adult students? So if you think about the stuff, you know, I hate STEM. I don't hate STEM, but I, mean, I hate to hear about STEM, STEM, STEM. STEM in and of itself is what? Why do we have to know STEM? Where, where on our journey is that taking us? What is that going to get us to? What will that enable us to do? What kids deserve is an engaging curriculum and a caring atmosphere so they can act on their natural desire to find out about stuff. Alfie Cohen, you should Google him. He's got a lot of great ideas against punishment and rewards. The reward in learning something is learning something. You don't need a sucker or a lollipop or maybe even a college degree, actually. What is the role of the teacher? I want you all to think of yourselves literally as teachers. You need to observe. You need to listen. You need to find yourself in a circumstance where you're not the one talking, where you're sitting on the side. You know when to intervene to ask the right questions. To remove obstacles to learning, especially for young children. This constant, never-ending drone of work that just like the dolphin, you got to say, in the end, how important was this? I, I used to, when I taught more before I was a dean, I used to ask my students, think of a time when you learned something. I want you to think of a time when you learned something. Most people think of learning how to ride a bike. Nobody gave you a reward for learning how to ride a bike. The reward was riding the bike. And... You kept doing it until you could do it, because you were engaged and you wanted to learn it. And the assessment was in the task itself. 
Most people will point to things like that where they could themselves say if they were successful or not. And of course, teachers have to be active learners. Every child should have a caring adult in their life. That means all of us. All people should help each other as teachers. So in closing, I'm going to say, how do we build this sloppy thing we call a democracy? Sloppy. Make mistakes. Doesn't always work. I think you can turn on CNN and see that. It has to be intelligent, engaged, self-learners, where we all have a responsibility to each other, to help each other learn, to be teachers, to be learners, to be actively engaged with our intellect. In, in this case, I mean, what John Dewey, a great educational philosopher, said is to create a democracy. And if our democracy ever needed thoughtful people more than now, I don't know when. So that's what, I'm what I would say to you, what I take on myself, not just as a dean, but as a person in this society. We are obligated to be teachers and learners.